All right, Pastor Michael's got his phone on. Let's see here. All right. Well, we are uh, we're here tonight discussing uh, chapters. One through three of First Kings, and we're going to be discuss, discussing uh, chapter three specifically. So, if you're here with us tonight, um, you are going to be wanting to turn to First Kings chapter three, and we're going to read uh, the first three verses of that to uh, to get a, an idea of uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. And so, First Kings chapter three, verses one through three. In that, it says Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh the king of Egypt, and married one of his daughters. He brought her to live in the city of David until he could finish building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around the city. At that time, the people of Israel sacrificed their offerings at local places of worship for a temple honoring the name of the Lord had not yet been built. And verse 3 is very important for us to look at. It says, Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father David. And then it says, except... That Solomon, too, offered sacrifices and burned incense at local places of worship. Um, Pastor Michael, could you do me a favor? Uh, You or Pastor Chris, can you share that on Facebook? That way people, because apparently I can't do it on my phone. I thought I could. So that way, if anybody wants to watch it on their computer that doesn't have it, they can watch it on their computer. So... That, that verse 3 is the most important one for us to look at tonight. In that it says, uh, Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father David, except that Solomon too offered sacrifices and burned incense at the local places of worship. Now, what was significant about that in that situation? Well, we see a foothold into Solomon's life, into maybe what's going on with Solomon, is that Solomon may have allowed himself to be exposed to some cultural things that were unbecoming of him being not only the king of Israel, but being someone who was supposed to be the spiritual leader and headship of the people of God. He allowed himself to be uh, connected in uh, situations and circumstances by sacrificing uh, at some of the local places as well. And so um, we need to look at that. And so the question tonight And I think uh, for some of us, we've already discussed it to a certain degree, but the question is, uh, what does it mean to be unequally yoked? And uh, is there a case or is there a cause for us to look at the life of Solomon and say, did Solomon uh, kind of portray himself as the the example of why this is important for us? Um, We know that uh, Deuteronomy speaks about this, and so the law existed and things uh, existed And so it was well aware that there was an importance to not allow yourself to be exposed to um, to foreign gods or foreign religions because of that. Now, God was so determined in him believing that it was important for his people to be set apart and for his people to to remain uh, sanctified from all of the evil uh, cultures around. He put a lot of things in motion that if we were to look back in biblical history, even books that we've studied in the Bible, we can see him working this out, and we've discussed it before. Um, before God told um, Isaac and Jacob and all of them, before God told Jacob to move uh, to Egypt, we see something happening uh, in that situation where uh, their family was intermingling with other religions, and they had to get away and get out. And even when they became... Um, in captivity in Egypt, there was a unique situation that was happening there where the Egyptians d- despised uh, the Jews and they wouldn't eat with them. They wouldn't share anything with them. They kind of made them isolated within, uh, even within their captivity. They were isolated from them. They did all these things even before they were in captivity. And as a result of that, they were able to grow. They were able to remain secure in their religion and in their movement. And then they weren't able to, uh, they didn't have to worry about their faith being Um, distorted and things like that. And so even in that, God was bringing together a multitude of people, uh, six million or so, as the time that they went out. And as as a result of that, he was able to grow uh, the the kingdom of God and grow the body um, of the Lord at the time without there being any intermingling. And so it's an important thing to think about. And so we're going to look at three aspects tonight. And I think Solomon 
that scripture in chapter 3 kind of gives us a prelude of what's going on in this situation. And so uh, for those of you that are tuning in on Periscope, that we talked a little bit about what unequally yoked was, and it's basically this notion of two people being connected together, and if they are not equally yoked together, then they're not going to move in the same direction and walk in the same place that they're supposed to walk. And so that's the problem that we see happening here. And so we're going to look at marriage first. Uh, just by show of hands, and nobody can see with the hands that are there or not there, I'm just going to ask you guys a question. Maybe if you don't have to raise your hand, you just kind of give me a little bit of a, uh, just a pondering time, of, or at least just to, to think about it. Do you think it's right, or you think that biblically a Christian should marry a non-Christian? Right? I think we're going to look at some instances here where this is a difficult situation. Dating a non-Christian, I think, uh, is unwise. I think someone that gets into a relationship with someone that is not a Christian, uh, it, just in terms of dating, is unwise. Growing up, we used to call it missionary dating. You ever heard of that before? Where somebody was not a Christian, and so we would go and date them in order to try to lead them to the Lord. And what happens normally in those situations is that the person that steps outside of, of God and starts in a relationship with someone that is not a Christian, oftentimes it does more harm than it does good. And so it's very difficult for that to happen. And so I know we have the best intentions involved. And there have been situations where people have come to know the Lord and their family has grown. And it's been a wonderful situation. But many times what we see here is that's not the case. Oftentimes we see it's the opposite. And so uh, for a Christian, dating a non-Christian is unwise. But marrying one, biblically, it's not an option. It shouldn't be the case. Now, that may not be an easy thing for us to uh, swallow at times, but uh, I think that there, there is two things that we see in Scripture. One, we see the command uh, of Christians uh, making sure that they don't get into a covenant relationship with an unbeliever because it's a covenant. Marriage is a covenant by God. So we see that. But afterwards, we see also examples of someone that is in a relationship with an unbeliever. Scripture says if they want to remain with you, then you are to be faithful to them and you are to hopefully lead them to the Lord by the way that you live. And so it's a difficult thing. Somebody might get saved and go, you know what, I'm a Christian, but my spouse isn't a Christian. And the Bible says I can't be yoked together with an unbeliever, so I need to get out of that union. But that's not what the Bible says. Once somebody's a Christian, if they have an unbelieving spouse that wants to stay with them, then they need to work it out. And in doing so, they lead them to the Lord. So it's important for us to understand the dynamics of that. But before you get into a relationship with them, know this, that the Lord says it is better. And it gives you the command to not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. You guys know where it says that in the Bible? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says uh, to not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And again, it's the, this, this imagery of two incompatible oxen sharing the same yoke. And so instead of working together to pull the load, they work against each other. So they're constantly at the other end of the spectrum. And so this passage doesn't specifically say that marriage is the issue or that marriage is the entity, but it definitely has implications for marriage, doesn't it? Marriage is a covenant where people agree together, they come together, and they're supposed to be united together to do something together. And so it has implications for marriage. And so it goes on to say further in this passage that there is no harmony between Christ or a Christian and a non-Christian or Christ and Belial. Right? What harmony can there be between Christ and Belial? There could be no spiritual harmony in a marriage between a Christian and a non-Christian. Paul goes on to remind believers that they are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit in this chapter. And he tells them that the Holy Spirit inhabits their hearts at salvation. So if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit has taken up residence inside of you and regenerated your heart to believe in the Lord. And so because of that, there is a definite separation from the world taking place. Because the world represents this, this system that is not filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Christian represents this entity that is filled with the Holy Spirit. And the two themselves cannot work together. And so we see this happening uh, in this situation. So they're in the world, but not of the world, right? In the world, but not of the world. And nowhere is that more important than when we think about marriage, right? Somebody in marriage needs to be in covenant with someone that has the same ideals as them. I've seen so many couples that have struggled as a result of that. Now, the Bible also says, do not be misled. Bad company, what? Corrupts good character. I heard a man say one time that uh, if you run with the dogs, you're going to catch fleas. Now, that may be offensive. I may have offended somebody. But 
The reality is, is that you've got to be careful what you open yourself up to. Because bad company corrupts good character. You may have the best uh, intentions in the world, but if you open yourself up to a certain things, to a level of intimacy that marriage brings, then you open yourself up to corruption. And so having any kind of intimate relationship with an unbeliever can quickly turn something into a hindrance uh, to your walk with the Lord. So we're called to evangelize the lost, aren't we? So that puts us in a difficult situation because we're called to interact with them. We're called to evangelize the world. We're called to, to do all these things. But in doing that, uh, we've got to make sure that we're not called to, to uh, marry them. We're called to evangelize them, not to uh, be intimate with them. Not to be intimate with them. So there's nothing wrong with building quality friendships with unbelievers. You know, I've got friends that, that I have, or acquaintances that I have, that I, that I have developed over the years, that they know I'm a pastor, and they, they're not a Christian. Uh, but I don't allow them, I only allow them so much influence in my life because if I open myself up and completely allow them to pour into me uh, their ideals and their philosophies, they, it's quite, quite possible that they could affect my spiritual walk with the Lord. And so I've got to be careful that I'm connected with them enough to where I can be an example of the Lord to them without it corrupting me. And so it's important for us uh, to do that. So we've got, we, we got to make sure we do that. So if, we're, if we are dating an unbeliever, and I know some of you uh, are married, and so the dating, the dating scene is, is maybe off. But some of you are maybe uh, thinking about dating in the future or hoping to, that there be a dating in the future. And so uh, think about this for a second. Maybe even you that are married. When you were dating, what was your priority when you were dating, was it romancing or was it trying to lead them closer to the Lord? Romancing, romancing right? If we're honest with ourselves, it was romancing. They were hot and we had the hots for them. And all we were thinking about was romancing. And so if somebody uh, gets into a relationship with the intentions of, I'm going to do my part to minister to them, to lead them to the Lord. That's just not going to happen. The reality is, is that they're going to get caught up in the romance side of it. And so if that person already doesn't have a foundation that's built on the Lord, the chances of them gaining that foundation uh, in that relationship by you uh, is going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. Now, the wonderful thing is, is that when two people get into a relationship that have a foundation on the Lord, then you can build off of that. And it's a wonderful thing. And you can see things working in the way that they need to go. And so... Uh, if you are married to an unbeliever, how would the two of you cultivate a spiritual intimacy in your marriage? This is where some people struggle, where they have a, someone who's a spouse who is a Christian and someone who's not a Christian. And for years, I, I witnessed that even in my own home with my mom and my dad. My dad wasn't a Christian and my mom loved him and was faithful to him. But there was always this disconnect in their relationship because he wasn't a Christian and she was. His ideals were one way. Her ideals were another way. And it was a dynamic thing that was taking place. So um, how could a quality marriage be built and maintained if you agree on the most crucial issue in the universe, right? Jesus. How can, you, how can you agree if the most crucial, crucial thing in the universe you disagree on? This person disagrees on the fact that Jesus is the only way to salvation. This person disagrees the fact that Jesus is our Savior and anyone that believes in Him uh, can have eternal life. They agree on those, those fundamental things. How can, you, how can you get together in a union? Because it's, a, it's a, team of, uh, a time of unity. And so it's important for us when we think about marriage and then we have an opportunity to talk to others about marriage and, and be an example to others, know this about us, that marriage is an important thing. And we've got to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to be in a situation where we are yoked together in a covenant relationship with someone that is an unbeliever. Make sense? Second is business. Do you think that it is wise for Christians to get in business with an unbeliever? Give me some practical examples why it is not wise for a Christian to get in business with an unbeliever. Right? Tithing was a good one. Yeah. Right? If, you are, if you're, you're a business owner and a portion of what you make you want to tithe uh, and you may, your other business partner may not feel that way, you're going you're gonna to have some friction there because they, they're not going to look at it that way. They're going to look at it a different way. What's some other examples? Ethics, right? Ethics is a big thing. Um, if you've ever been in business with someone or you've done business with someone that isn't a Christian or even if you've worked in the business field with non-Christians, you know that there is a code of ethics that everyone has to live by and go by in the business world. But sometimes there are opportunities where you can do the right thing or you can do the wrong thing, right? And Christians sometimes do the wrong thing as well. But if you are building your life on the foundation of God's word and living for the Lord the way you need to live, then you're going to be living life by a different set of standards. And so you're going to be more inclined to do the right thing because God's word says to do the right thing. But if you're dealing with somebody that isn't a Christian and isn't an unbeliever, they may not do the right thing. 
They may say, for instance, you have a, uh, a pharmacy that you're running, or maybe you have a business where you, you give prescription drugs, and you know that the right thing to do is to give them exactly what they pay for, to give them exactly what they do, but this person might be cutting corners and trying to shave things off. I know some have worked in uh, different construction fields, and so uh, if, if you work in a construction department and somebody says, well, I'm going to charge this and I'll do this, only you and God know what you're going to do and they don't know, that's where the ethics comes in because somebody that isn't a Christian might not do that, and you might think, well, what's the big deal about that if nobody knows? Well, the reality is, is God knows, right? But the Bible also says that, uh, that our sins will find us out, right? And so if somebody, you get in business with somebody that is not a believer and you yoke yourself together with them, your future with them, the danger in that is you're going to find yourself in a situation of being held by the judgment that they're going to be held in by their own actions. And so we've got to be careful for that. So what was the scripture that we read in 2 Corinthians 6, 14? Do not be unequally yoked with what? Unbelievers. But also says, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? So we think about this verse, and we've obviously talked about it in terms of marriage, but it also applies to business. It applies to us living uh, and being in business with someone um, of that type. So it comes through all different types of of uh, unequally yokes through marriage, intimate friendships, and business partnerships. And so we've already discussed some of these things, but there's a great difference that exists between, or there should be a great difference that exists between a believer and a what? Non-believer. If you are in business with a non-believer and you never conflict each other, one or two things are happening. Either they are a believer and you didn't know it, or you're not. That's just the reality of it. If you are able to work seamlessly with a non-believer in a business adventure together without any friction, then there is a problem arising, maybe, potentially. Either you are not a Christian or not living the way you should live, or maybe they're a little more of a believer than you think they are. And I'm not even talking about uh, somebody has to have uh, ordination papers in order to get in business with them. If you know somebody's a solid Christian, then you, you know that that's something the Lord is going to be honored with. So uh, motivations, goals, and the methods of Christians are, by and large, incompatible with those of an unbeliever. Should they not be? By and large, motivations, goals. So in business, what is a Christian motivated for? Not only to make money and be successful, but what else? Honor the Lord, right? And how you run your business. Well, if a Christian is up against a situation of, okay, either I'm going to make money or I'm going to honor the Lord. What do you think a Christian should do in that situation? Honor the Lord, right? And if that means getting out of business, that means getting out of business. But an unbeliever has the same priority of making money, so what are they going to do? They're going to make money at all costs, right? Because the object is to make money. And so you see potential conflicts there. Goals, methods, uh, generally should be incompatible, and they are with an unbeliever. So why is that? I believe faith changes a person, doesn't it? If somebody has an experience with the Lord, as we talked about Sunday, it changes everything about them. They don't operate the same way that they used to operate. Things are different. And so a Christian's highest ambition in life should be to glorify the Lord, to honor the Lord in the way that they live, and to please Him in all that they do. And so an unbeliever, at best, might be indifferent towards those kinds of things. At best, they might go, I don't think that's a bad idea, but I don't live my life by it. That's the best case scenario. They might go, listen, you got your thing, I'll let you do whatever, that's fine. That's best case scenario, but they're, they're, never, they're never going to completely agree with the ideals of a Christian unless they become a Christian. Non-believer also is subject, real subject to greed. Sure. They won't take more than their share. Well, it's a temptation that even a believer has to deal with, but a believer at least has that foundation of the Bible, knowing what God says about greed. And knowing what God says about, about, about doing things in an honorable way. And so there's where the Holy Spirit begins to speak to their heart in those moments where they're tempted. Whereas an unbeliever doesn't have the Holy Spirit in their life because he hasn't received the Lord. And so he's not going to feel that same kind of, of uh, upfilling up of the Holy Spirit when it comes to those things. Because as a Christian, how many times have you been tempted to do something and that scripture verse comes in the back of your mind, right? The Holy Spirit brings up remembrance to something, and you see this situation happening, and so you go forward from there. And so uh, it's important for us to see how this works. So if a Christian's methods and goals in business are identical to the methods and goals of an unbeliever, 
the Christian very likely needs to reevaluate and reconsider his or her priorities, right? If you, are, if you have been in business with an unbeliever and you don't disagree in any way, shape, or form with them and don't have any issues with them, then you need to reevaluate your priorities because maybe you're not living in a way that's going to honor the Lord. So, we said earlier, what fellowship can light have with darkness? Well, when you're in fellowship, uh, it means you share something. We come together and we're in fellowship tonight in studying God's Word. We're sharing God's Word together. So when you're in business with somebody, you're in fellowship with them. You're sharing something with them. Very often, if you're in business with someone, you're going to have a portion of the business. They're going to have a portion of the business. And you're going to share in the good and the bad. And so you're in fellowship with that. So with these principles in mind, um, when you think about uniting unbelievers with believers, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing for it to happen. So if a Christian is truly seeking the honor of the Lord through the business, conflict with the unbelieving business partner is unavoidable. Unless that person accepts the Lord and they begin to change their priorities. Now, Scripture says in Amos 3.3, Can two walk together unless they what? Be agreed. Can two walk together unless they be agreed. So is it a good idea for a Christian to get in, into a business venture with an unbeliever? No, not a good idea. Now, am I saying that you shouldn't work for an unbeliever? I didn't say that. Right? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you should avoid working for a non-believer or a company that doesn't promote the Lord. That's a decision between you and the Lord. I'm saying when you align yourself and yoke yourself into a business venture with someone, that's between you and the Lord. When it comes to whether or not you feel comfortable working for somebody that's not a Christian. But I don't think God's telling us as Christians that we can't work for someone that isn't a Christian. But it's saying when you tie yourself together in a business venture, when it comes to you starting a business or you running something and you yoking yourself together with someone, you gotta, you got to be careful with that. And so that may mean not working for somebody. It may mean just uh, not putting all of your eggs in one basket. It's a different, difficult thing. And so we got to be uh, aware of that. Third is this. Is it possible or should Christians be have intimate friendships with unbelievers? No. No. I went, growing up in school, I went to a Christian school, but I had a lot of friends that, that weren't Christians that went to the school that I went to. And so the difficulty that we had is we, we'd, you know, we'd want to be friends with them and hang out with them and invite them to church. And some of them came to church and we saw each other at school and things like that. But the reality is, is that I couldn't really go very far in that friendship because their ideals were completely different than mine. And there was a certain point where I was faced with a situation. Either, either I sacrificed what I believe in in order to grow this relationship or this relationship is only going to take go but so far because we have different ideals. So, is it true? And Do you think that as Christians we face temptation every day? What kind of temptations do we face every day? Name it, right? Lust, greed, gossip, right? All different kinds of things we face on a regular basis. And so, uh, as a Christian, we got to make sure that uh, we recognize that everything we see, read, put in our bodies, it affects us, doesn't it? Everything we read, see, do, it affects us. And so uh, to maintain a close relationship with the Lord as a Christian, it's very important that you surround yourself with a group of people that are going to challenge you in your walk with the Lord. So if all you do is surround yourself with people that don't challenge you to live for the Lord and don't encourage you in your walk with the Lord then the chances are they're going to be doing the opposite. And that's just the reality of it. The opposite of, of somebody that's going to challenge you in your walk with the Lord is somebody that's going to challenge you to not walk with the Lord. That's going to tempt you to do the things that you used to do. And so when we accept the Lord, uh, our old habits go away, right? The old habit of doing things should change, right? There should be a difference in, in us because faith changes us, does it not? That's what we said earlier. Faith changes us. And so there's a difference. And so the old habits that we have, the activities that we participated in, uh, and the people we spend time with sometimes has to change as the Lord moves in our life. There have been times where I had friends that I grew up with, like I mentioned earlier, that as I got older and the Lord began to grow in me, they weren't walking the same path that I was walking. And as a result, our relationship struggled. I even had family members that didn't walk the same path that I was walking. And as a result, I couldn't be as close to them as I used to be. Our relationship wasn't the same as it used to be because they were not walking the same path that I was. I loved them. I would do anything for them. If I saw them at the store tonight or any time, I would shake their hand. I would hug them. We would talk about old times. But 
as far as them opening up and me getting into an intimate covenant relationship, a friendship with them, unless they were walking the same path as me and my wife, I'm not going to be able to do that because it's only going to draw me down. Now, I can encourage them, and I have to be connected to them enough to encourage them, but if I'm not careful, I could pull them away. And we see that happen with Solomon. How many wives does Solomon have? Do you guys remember? We haven't really gotten to it yet, but how many? He had 700 wives and how many concubines? 300, 300 concubines. So he had 1,000 uh, altogether. That's crazy, right? 600 wives and 300 concubines. Yeah, right? Yeah, I'm sure you, they had like a, you ever gone to like a livestock where you're trading cattle? Well, they probably had like uh, tattoos on their shoulders or whatever on their hands. Number two, number, I mean, you had to do something. You would never know. Um, name tags, right? They had to come with name tags. So anyway, Solomon not only had many concubines and wives, but he, he gathered together many foreign wives and concubines and built temples for them, as we'll see later in his life. And it started out by him getting together in a union with uh, Pharaoh's daughter, the king of Egypt. Now, was that unusual for kingdoms to unite? No, it wasn't unusual. It was a normal thing, right? It was kind of a, a way for power, uh, for them to connect power and things like that. And so it wasn't unusual for that to happen, for them to see those kinds of things taking place. Uh, but the difference is, is that God clearly told them not to be together with cultures that did not honor the Lord. And they went as so far in their history to look at all the battles that were fought and tribes and cities that were destroyed that did not recognize the Lord as the one true God. So why would God now be indifferent towards them getting together in relationship with somebody that doesn't believe in the Lord? So it's an important thing. And ironically enough, even though Solomon fell prey to this, Solomon was known for what? Wisdom. Being the wisest man, right? Scripture says, and it's in First Kings 3, that it says that he was given something that nobody else ever had. And nobody else will ever have again, right? So it was literally saying he was going to be the wisest man that ever lived at that point, and there will no be there will never be another person that was that was more wise than Solomon. So Solomon was the wisest man that ever walked the face of the earth, and he wrote a book um, called Proverbs. And in that book, he gave life lessons about interacting with people that were unbelievers. Now, it's sad when you look at Solomon's life to go. Solomon was a great. King. He was one of the greatest kings in all of Israel. He, he built the temple. He did all of these things. But yet he didn't adhere to his own wisdom or even the wisdom that he was demonstrating to others. But this is what it says in Proverbs when it comes to believers befriending non-believers. It says, The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Solomon said that. Proverbs 12, 26. We should stay away from foolish people, 13.20 and 14.7. From people who lose their temper easily, Proverbs 22.24. And from the rebellious, Proverbs 24.21. Now all of these characteristics in, in the book of Proverbs represent somebody that is unregenerate, that does not have a relationship with the Lord. It's just the fact of the matter of it. Somebody uh, that uh, is wicked, somebody that is foolish, somebody that loses their temper easily, that is rebellious. These are not characteristics of believers. These are the characteristics of unbelievers. And so Solomon gives wisdom in saying, be careful what you do and how much you interact with these kinds of people. Sadly, though, uh, in his life, he didn't adhere to that, and he paid the price for that. And that's sad sometimes, and we see many times uh, this is what was happening, and what we see situations happening in this is that people know what to say and know what they should do, but it doesn't always mean they do what they should do. Right? You ever been there? I know the way that I'm supposed to live. I know the way that I'm supposed to act. I just don't always do it. And so, you know, knowing the truth is not uh, just always important, right? Because the Bible says not just be hearers of the word, right? But to what? Be doers of the word. And so we couldn't just, oh, I know what I'm supposed to do. And just because I know what's right, then that's going to be okay. No, we have to, well, if we know what the truth is, then we have to do our part to live by the truth. And live by the word of God. And if we do that, then we'll see the blessings of God in our life. And though Solomon was blessed and God showed him incredible grace towards the end of his life, sadly, it says that his wives turned his heart away from the Lord. Now, if Solomon is the wisest man that ever walked the face of the earth and God anointed him and blessed him and, and, and furthered his kingdom and did all these things for him, if he himself still struggled and still fell prey by intermingling himself so closely with unbelievers... Do you not think that we ourselves need to be careful about what we do? 
Now again, what am I saying? Am I telling you that if somebody uh, you know, the Lord puts somebody in your path that's not a Christian, that you should not talk to them, you shouldn't speak to them, you should just ignore them, you should put blinders on your eyes, you should lock yourself in your house, in your church, and never talk to anybody that's not a Christian. Well, that's not what the Bible says either, is it? It says we're supposed to go out and we're supposed to encourage them. We're supposed to be lights to them, examples to them. But we've got to be careful what we do because in two ways, this is what happens. If we're trying to befriend those that are unbelievers, there's a temptation sometimes for us to water down the truth of God's Word, isn't it? Because we don't want to offend them. We don't want to lose their friendship because their friendship may mean more to us than even living by the truth. And so we'll kind of pull back on what the Bible says because we don't want to lose them as a friend and we don't want to hurt their feelings. But the reality is is that if we truly live for the Lord, then we've got to make sure that we stand for the Lord in those situations. And it's our responsibility to go out and tell others about the Lord. So in Solomon's situation, Solomon had an incredible opportunity, an incredible privilege to live for the Lord, an incredible opportunity to live for the truth and to be the example. But as a result of his lack of faith, and as a result of his willingness to intermingle with other cultures and allow other gods to be worshipped and allow other practices that were unbiblical to, to, to exist... It costs his heart to be turned away from the Lord. And if we do the same thing in our life today, if we allow ourselves to be uh, pulled away from the truth of God's word for friendships, if we allow ourselves to be pulled away from the truth of God because of fear of a business venture or even fear of losing our job, if we allow ourselves to be pulled away uh, because of a relationship that we're in, then we are not doing what God called us to do. We should stand true and stand firm and believe that God's going to work these things out. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, right? I'm so thankful that uh, we see this, uh, that um, Solomon is the example for us because it can help us. You know, we don't have to make the same mistakes that Solomon made. We don't have to do the same things that Solomon did. We don't have to uh, live the same way that many of these biblical characters lived. We can live for the truth, and that truth can set us free. And so it's my hope tonight that as we have studied First. Kings 1 through 3, and we start to see this life of Solomon take shape, that we keep that in the back of our mind, that you have to not only know the truth, but you have to do it. You have to live it. You have to allow it to be the Lord of your life. You have to surrender to the truth. And so it isn't just about what our wisdom brings us, because we know that our knowledge uh, comes from the Lord. He opens our eyes to see the truth, and so we should submit to His Word and allow Him to lead us and guide us. And so uh, let that be an encouragement to us tonight that uh, as the Lord leads us and guides us, there's etiquette and there's a way we need to handle ourselves. And so if we're going to grow and we're going to continue to grow, we need to center ourselves and surround ourselves with people that are where we want to be. So if I want to be a better husband, then I'm going to surround myself with people that have loved their wives the way God wants them to love them. I'm not going to surround myself with people that treat their wives horrible. I want to surround myself with people that love their wives. If I want to be, uh, if I want to be successful in business, then I'm going, to, I'm going to find a Christian that's successful in business. I'm going to pattern my business after that Christian and their, their model. And there are so many motivational speakers that are Christians and people that are, that, are, that are launching businesses that you can talk to, that you can get into a covenant with, and that you, you can grow and they can, they can challenge you instead of you looking at uh, negative examples of somebody that, how they got into business and what they did, because that's not the way a Christian should act. The same way with you having a friend. If you want to be friends with someone and you want to gain friendships with other Christians, surround yourselves with people that are like-minded and you'll begin to see those friendships together. And so sometimes I think we, we, look at, we look at friendships as everything that we can get out of them. And that's really not the definition of a friend. A friend is somebody that you can love on, that you can, you can be a blessing to. Because if our friendships are just based on what our friends do for us, then that's not really, that's not really a good thing, right? Sometimes you love people just because you love them and you're friends with them because of, of just your personalities connect. And God has brought all of us together. And there's going to be more people that God brings in your path. And as the Lord opens our eyes and their eyes, then we're going to be able to grow together in friendships. So it's important for us to protect ourselves and to guard ourselves. Because the Bible says that the heart, in, in, in first uh, century church, the heart is the most important part of a person. It's the center of a person. And so that's why it says in Proverbs uh, also, Solomon said this, protect your heart, right? Above all else, for out of it flows the wellspring of life. Solomon said this, above all else, protect your heart, because out of it flows the wellspring of life. So let's not be like Solomon and hear the preacher's words and hear Proverbs and read the words and have the revelations of God and know what the truth is, yet go through and make the same mistakes that Solomon made and eventually have ourselves turned away from the Lord. That's not the way it should be, and we don't want that to be the case. Amen?
Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would bless us tonight, Lord. I pray that everybody here and those that were watching, Lord, I pray that they would be blessed tonight, Lord. I pray that they would be challenged uh, to live for you and that their hearts would grow and that they would look to you, God, the author and perfecter of their faith, Lord. I pray that they wouldn't just allow themselves to be consumed with their own desires and things that they think are right and things that they want to do, Lord, but they would look to you and they would let you be their example, God. So I pray that that if there's anybody that's thinking about getting into a relationship with someone, Lord, I pray that you would allow them to have this this one thing in front of them, Lord, that they better be a believer. If they're not a believer, then it's not wise for me to get into a relationship with them, Lord. And if I'm going to get into a business venture, if I'm going to go uh, in, into business with someone, i got to be careful that, I, that they are not an, an unbeliever, Lord, because that's not what you want me to do because our ideals are different, Lord. And i got to be careful who I yoke myself to because of, of the ideals that you called me to live by, Lord. And the same thing goes by friendships. If I'm going to be friends with someone, Lord, if anybody's going to be friends with someone, Lord, let them have the prerequisite of knowing that they've got to be believers in order for me to allow them intimate friendship into my life to be able to have that covenant relationship with them, Lord. I've got to be careful who I allow into my life for the influences that they're going to give me. Father, I pray that we would live uh, the way that you'd have us to live and that we would look at Solomon's life, not in a negative way, in the tense uh, of, all of all the things that he did that were wrong, but to look at the example that he gave us, at least of how we shouldn't live, or even the truths that he spoke in Proverbs of how we should. But I pray that we would not just hear the word, but that we'd be doers of the word tonight. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for watching tonight. Uh, go in Him.